great to be reminded of the work Christ did on the cross and what a privilege we have every Sunday of celebrating that as we gather for worship. Well, two weeks ago on the first Sunday of the year, we reviewed and unpacked our mission statement. Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. We want to move as a church, when we talk about discipleship, we want to move every believer, uh, no matter where they are in their walk with Christ, we want to move them toward maturity in their faith. And so the question is, well, how do we get there? What is the process or what's the pathway to move someone toward maturity? You know, we can't assume just because someone is attending church, even on a regular basis, that they're growing in Christ. We, we have to point them to a target or point them to a goal line. You've probably heard the old saying, aim at nothing, and you'll hit it every time. Well, we want to aim at nothing. Uh, we want to have some steps or some, some markers in place that indicate that a believer is growing and continuing to grow. We need a path that anyone can be encouraged to follow, and we need to all be able to speak the same language um, when it comes to that process of discipleship. So we have developed a discipleship pathway and we've developed that from what we see modeled in the early church. We've taken what the early church did to make disciples and developed a model from that. And, and it's a pathway that not, not only advances the individual believer in their relationship with Christ, but it also advances the work of the kingdom, getting the gospel message out all over the world, just like Jesus called us to do. Well, what is our discipleship pathway? There are six steps. I'm gonna run through them very quickly because we'll be covering these steps each week over the next five weeks. But our discipleship pathway has six uh, stepping stones, if you will. The first, of course, is salvation, that a person must come to faith in Christ. Secondly, and following that closely, would be testimony and baptism. When a person comes to salvation, we want them to be able to share their testimony. We want them as quickly as possible to be able to follow in believer's baptism, signifying that they have placed their faith in Christ. Third step is biblical community. We need to move people into biblical community. That's not just going to Sunday school, but it's being part of a group, whether it's Sunday school, a, a D group, being part of a group where you're doing life with other people. Uh, biblical community leads to the fourth step. These two kind of go together, and that's spiritual growth and accountability. Uh, we want people as they are in biblical community to have opportunity to talk about their faith, to talk about where they need help, to be accountable um, to others in that. The fifth step as we move toward more mature discipleship is that we're moving people to be equipped to live on mission, wherever they are, in their workplace, in their neighborhood, even within their own family, that they're equipped to live on mission. And what is the mission? Making disciples. And then finally, as we're equipping believers to live on mission, finally, we're moving us individually and as a church toward kingdom expansion. Uh, we wanna do what Jesus called us to do in expanding the kingdom and going all over the world and sharing the gospel message and making disciples. Now, that six steps, that discipleship pathway represents the journey that we want everyone who's a part of our Geyer Springs family to be on and to be a part of. We, we want to walk that path together. We want to be able, as we're walking together, to encourage each other in moving forward. Now, let's be honest. Some will go uh, farther than others. Some will go deeper. But ultimately, we're all moving toward kingdom expansion, making disciples who make disciples. That's how we expand God's kingdom here on this earth. So this morning, we're gonna cover uh, the first step, the first stepping stone of that discipleship path. Uh, it's the first step, it's the foundational step, everything else follows. You cannot be a disciple of Christ without having come to the point of salvation. Clearly, you can't be a follower of Christ if you've not committed your life to him. Now, you might wonder, well, why are we even speaking to step one? I mean, if, if you're in church, you understand salvation, right? Well, not necessarily. Um, there are people in, in our church and in every church, there are people who are watching online messages just like this, who may even do that regularly, who are trying to be good people. They're trying to please God, but they've never come to recognize their need for salvation. Now, for those of you who know Christ, if you've truly been saved, it's a good uh, practice for all of us when we've placed our faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, it's a good practice to remember. Um, to go back and reflect on the biblical truth about our salvation. So that's what we're going to do today. Recently, I was having lunch with a, a, a pastor friend, and he was asking me about another pastor, and he said, do you know, and he, he named the person's name. 
You know, and I thought about anytime you have someone ask you a question like that, there are three basic responses you might give. You would either say, no, I've never heard of him or I've never heard of her, her. or you might say, well, I, I've heard the name, I know a little bit about them. Or you might say, oh yes, well, I know him well or I, I know her well, we have lunch regularly and catch up or we've worked on projects together. And as a pastor, when I think about uh, preaching God's word, those three responses represent the three people groups that I try to keep in mind. You know, it's very rare to have someone in that first group um, to be here at church on a Sunday. Someone who would say about Jesus, no, I've, I've never heard of him. Uh, it's rare because at this point in their lives, they're probably not looking for Jesus. Unless, unless they've been invited by someone to come just out of curiosity, they're not looking for Jesus. So they, they probably wouldn't show up here. That's why Jesus told us to go. They're not gonna come here. We, we have to get beyond these walls and get the name of Jesus out to our friends and our coworkers and our neighbors, people who need to know Jesus but don't even know yet that they have that need. It's very normal on every Sunday to have people in that third group. Uh, you know, I said one of the responses was, oh yes, I, I know him well or I know her well and we, we spend time together. It's normal to have those people here in attendance each Sunday. They know Jesus well. They have a personal relationship with him. They spend regular time with him. They, they do life with him daily. I just want to say to many of you who are in that category, I'm so thankful that you're part of this body and that you're part of our online congregation, that you have a love for Jesus and you have a desire to keep growing and to grow deeper with him. But this morning, I'm really focused on that second group. You know, the second response is, well, I, I've heard the name. I know a little bit about him or a little bit about her. That second group represents people who know about Jesus. They, they've heard the name of Jesus. They maybe even have a level of, of respect or admiration for him. But when those people, when you think about that second group, when those people say they know him or know about him or know something, that doesn't mean that they know him personally. And this morning, I want to tell you that when we as, a, as staff pastors, when we discuss or pray or um, try to figure out how to minister to these three groups of people. We, we have some designations or some names that we use. They're not, not derogatory by any means. They just help us know about whom we're talking and, and they help us when we're discussing where people are in their spiritual journey. People in that first category that would say, no, I've never heard of him. Uh, we just simply say they're unbelievers. We know that they haven't come to the point yet where they have enough information to come to saving faith. So when we talk about unbelievers, obviously we're talking about what do we need to do to make Jesus known to them. We know they ha we have to go to them with the message that they're not coming to us. That last group, um, we call Christ followers. They're not simply people who believe there is a God or believe something about him, but they're people who accept the fact that Jesus died for sinners. They know that they're a sinner but they've also given their lives over to him. They've made the decision to let Jesus control their lives. Uh, you know, I think you could define salvation with one word, surrender. People who have surrendered their lives, they live with Jesus as the ruler of their lives. And that's where we get the term Lord. When we talk about lordship, these people um, walk with Jesus. He's Lord of their life. They're faithful in walking with him every day. But the middle group is really the subject of what I want to talk about this morning when we talk about uh, salvation, this message on salvation. And I'll be honest, it's kind of a tough group to define. Um, that, that middle group who've heard something or know something about Jesus, um, they, they probably know who he is. They may understand that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sin. They may be thankful for that. They know something of the Bible. Um, they're probably pretty comfortable uh, being in a church, in a church setting. They may know a few people who are totally sold out to Jesus, and, and while they might think those people are a little bit radical, they're not necessarily uncomfortable around them. Now, I don't uh, intend this to be a label, it's just simply a description. We call people in that middle group cultural Christians. Cultural Christians, and there's two reasons we use this term. One is a cultural Christian has grown up in a, in a culture or environment that has communicated to them that they're okay with God. That culture, that environment around them has told them, hey, if you're basically a good person and, and you do more good things than bad things, 
God's cool with you. You're, you're fine with him. The second reason <clears throat> we use the term cultural Christian is a cultural Christian is typically very comfortable in the culture that they live in. Um, they're living in a culture that uh, they're not at odds with, but if they were to pursue a relationship with God, come to salvation, come to faith, come to lordship, then they might, that relationship with God might begin to put them at odds with culture, and they're certainly not ready for that. Now, let me say this, a cultural Christian is definitely not a, not a bad person. Uh, they're, they're not someone that Christ's followers or even more radical believers would shun. They'd be very comfortable in a group of, of Christians. And we're not, day to, not, not here today. I'm not trying to put down uh, cultural Christians in any way. But we need to understand what it means and understand a cultural Christian's need to come to faith in Christ. And I'll say a few of you um, that, that are listening today online probably fall into that category of being a cultural Christian. And I want to say I'm thankful that you've tuned in and that you probably uh, tune in not only to me but to other pastors as well. I'm thankful that you're hearing uh, the message of the gospel. And my prayer today is that you would hear from God, perhaps in a way that you've never heard from him before. Um, but I just want you to understand that, that I love the fact that cultural Christians are in our church and in our online audience. And let me tell you too, rest assured, being a cultural Christian, it's not like you're the odd man out. Many people attend this church and other churches as well who are cultural Christians. They're not bad people, they just haven't fully understood or haven't chosen to accept the full message of the gospel. So let me give you some characteristics that would kind of define a cultural Christian. And then also I want us to look at what a cultural Christian needs to know and understand about salvation and becoming a disciple of Christ. First characteristic is that most cultural Christians have grown up in the South, in the Bible Belt. That doesn't mean there aren't cultural Christians in other places, but the South is more conservative and the Bible Belt is an easy place in which a cultural Christian can grow. Um, it's a culture that is strongly influenced by Judeo-Christian values. And so in this culture, it's acceptable to talk about spiritual matters. It's, it's acceptable um, to go to church. Church attendance is commendable. Sometimes it's even encouraged. So cultural Christians are people who have grown up in a culture that makes them feel good spiritually, even if they don't have a relationship with Christ. The second thing about cultural Christians, it's really important to understand, is cultural Christians are typically good people. They're very um, conservative, they, they serve their community, they serve others, they make good friends, good neighbors, good co-workers, they're good people. And that's an important thing to think about because there are many people who believe that they're in right relationship with God because they're good people. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But a cultural Christian feels pretty good about where they are spiritually and religiously because they're good people. Thirdly, cultural Christians believe in God. They believe that God exists. They believe that God created the world and that he, as a creator, watches over human life. They believe that God wants us to be uh, kind to others, to be good, to be fair, to be people who treat others with, with justice. Uh, they believe um, that God is involved in our lives to a degree. And here's the degree that they believe. They believe that God is involved in our lives when we need him uh, to resolve a problem or when there's a crisis. Other than that, they don't think God's involvement in their life is a necessary thing. And then finally, they believe that God will let good people go to heaven when they die. So the bottom line, very simply, is that a cultural Christian is not a person who's irreligious. Um, cultural Christians believe in a loving God. They typically accept Jesus' virgin birth. They accept his sinless life, his death, his resurrection. They don't deny any of those facts. Uh, they admire Jesus, but they don't really need him. They might be more of a, uh, we would say, a fan of Jesus than a follower of Jesus. And, and cultural Christians believe that they are fine with God, that their relationship with God is just fine. They believe they're on good terms with him because they're familiar with uh, Christianity, they're comfortable in a church setting. They believe that God accepts them uh, as they are because they have a good moral code. Now, that really sounds good to a lot of people, but this morning I want you to understand it's a pretty serious misunderstanding of the gospel message. In fact, I would say it's a deadly misunderstanding of the gospel message. You know, if I asked those of you watching online, do you believe in God? And if I could see you 
If I asked if you believe in God, probably every hand listening would go up. But the same thing is true of the vast majority of people out in our society. You, you could walk the streets and ask people, do you believe in God? And the vast majority of them would say, yeah, uh, I believe in God. So maybe a better question would be, well, what kind of God do you believe him to be? See, some people believe he's just the big man upstairs who's very benevolent toward his creation. Some believe he's a God who is more than willing to overlook our shortcomings and, and he's there to serve us and to, to bless us and to do good things for us. Most people's concept of God is more the concept of a, of a, of a genie or a, a mascot or a good luck charm. That is not who the God of the Bible is. And, and part of the problem is the church. For far too long, preachers have focused so much on um, the love and mercy of God and they've excluded uh, referring to his holiness and his wrath. Uh, preachers are afraid that if they preach a hard message, people might not come back because they think the church is judgmental or the, think the church is unloving. Well, I personally believe I'd rather them think that about me than recognize the lack of love I displayed in allowing them to spend eternity in hell. See, the Bible says that, that you and I, every one of us, need to believe in a holy God and we need to fear a holy God. That's a proper um, understanding of the gospel that understanding the gospel starts with knowing that no one is good enough for God. You might say, well, I'm not an atheist and, and I went to VBS as a kid. I, I go to church occasionally or maybe I even go to church fairly regularly. I'm a good person, I have morals, I, I treat other people right. Listen, none of that makes you and me okay with God. None of that earns us a home in heaven, a relationship with him. You, you can't be okay with God because you're a sinner whose heart is full of evil. And all of us are sinners. And all of us have hearts filled with evil. So that, how we act and how we behave and the good we do, doesn't make us okay with God. See, what we need to do is take an intense look at the God of the Bible. Yes, he is merciful and he is loving, but he will not overlook our depravity. He's a holy God, and as we truly look into his holiness, we should be devastated by our own wickedness and our depravity and our rebellion against him. We, and when I say we, I'm talking about every one of us, all of mankind are wretched sinners. No one, not one of us, deserves the grace and mercy of God. What we deserve is judgment. What we deserve is, is wrath. What we deserve is eternal torment and suffering in hell. Listen to the words that Paul penned in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now that's a pretty convicting passage when you really look at it. When you truly uh, comprehend the perfect holiness of God, you recognize you can never be good enough on your own. You can't do enough good things to be accepted by God. You can't attend church or be around uh, Christian people and Christian things enough to be accepted by God. Let me tell you, you can attend church every week, and some do, and still not be a true follower of Jesus. Now I know when you tune in for a message or when people come into the building, come to church for a message, they're hoping that they're gonna hear a positive and encouraging word that leaves them feeling good and happy and loved. And, and those kind of messages are important. But sometimes the message is hard truth and we have to look at hard truth to make sure we're where God wants us to be. And what I'm telling you this morning is we all need to understand the depth of our sinful condition. Listen to me clearly. Good people don't go to heaven because there are no good people. My definition, your definition of good doesn't match up to God's definition of good. So good people are not going to heaven because none of us are good. We're, we're wretched and we're hopeless and we're helpless. And, and I'm not trying to make you, to beat you down or make you feel bad about yourself, but the reality is if we're gonna understand biblically what the Bible says about salvation, the reality is there are going to be a lot of shocked good people in hell because they thought they were good enough to earn God's acceptance. Good people don't go to heaven. Righteous people go to heaven. 
And we're not righteous in and of ourselves, not one of us. Listen to the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. So our only hope for righteousness is Jesus. Think about this. If good people were able to go to heaven on their own merit, if good people were able to go to heaven because they did enough good things or the good outweighed the bad, if good people were able to go to heaven on their own, why did Jesus need to die? Jesus had to die because there was, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, no one righteous, no one who doesn't sin. He's the only one who never sinned. He's the only one who could be righteous enough. And so that leads us to understanding of our need for Jesus. We have to come to the point of saving faith, looking past our perceived goodness that we think we have and seeing the depths of evil in us. And when we see that and understand that and recognize that Jesus is our only hope, placing our faith and trust in him, surrendering our life to him, when we get to that point, then we've come to saving faith. You see, I think when we really see that our goodness is not enough and we see how depraved we are in light of God's holiness, when we get to that point, we have no problem throwing ourselves at the feet of Jesus and crying out for mercy. We have no problem at that point confessing the sin of our own self-righteousness. And when we get to that point, then we're ready to repent. We're ready to surrender. And, and Scripture says we become a new creature or, or a new person. So how do you move from being a cultural Christian to being a true Christ follower? Well, first step is you have to reject your self-righteousness and receive the righteousness of Christ. You have to recognize that your self-righteousness is not enough. And you gotta stop trying to be good enough and stop trying to earn your way into God's favor. You have to come to the point of understanding that you need a savior because you're a sinner and God says the payment for your sin is death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus. God in his mercy is willing to set aside, if we'll come to Jesus and take his righteousness, he's willing to set aside the wrath that we deserve and let us be in right relationship with him because of the righteousness of Jesus. Now I'm about to wrap up, but don't miss this last thing because this is really important. And this is where I think a lot of people miss um, in, in their salvation experience. They miss what it really means to truly surrender. When you come to the point of needing uh, to surrender, of understanding that Christ has died for your sins, it's not simply a matter of praying, Jesus, forgive me my sin and give me a home in heaven. When you come to the point of salvation, you understand that Jesus cannot be your savior unless you make him your Lord. What I'm trying to say is you don't get to say, well, Jesus, would you forgive me my sin and give me a home in heaven? But for now, let me live life the way I want to live life. No, that's not salvation at all. That's not what the gospel message is about. That's not biblical. Jesus saves those who surrender themselves completely to him. That's the point where salvation occurs. Well, what do I mean by surrender? Well, when you surrender, if you think of two opposing armies, when one army or one people surrender to another, when you surrender, you give, give up your rights. And you pledge yourself in service to the one who conquered you. You pledge yourself in service to your master. That means you live to please him. That means that you do what he says, that you obey. He calls the shots, he's in complete control. And that's what's important for us to understand about salvation today is that it's not simply uh, asking Christ to be your savior and forgive your sin, but it's making him Lord of your life. If, if you're a cultural Christian, you have to understand that you don't get to just ignore him and call on him when you're in a jam. You surrender all of your life to him. You make him Lord of life. Let me close with two short verses that I think make this very clear. And these are from Jesus' own words. In Matthew 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Jesus said, you, you might call me Lord, but what makes it very clear that I'm truly your Lord is when you do the will of my Father, when you obey. And then in Luke 6, 46, 
Jesus made it even more clear. He said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? The one who has truly come to saving faith, the one who's made Christ Savior and Lord of life, lives life for Christ, has completely surrendered to him. So there are many, Jesus would say, there are many who call him Lord, but there's no corresponding action or obedience. There's no evidence in their life. They, they call him Lord, but they continue in habitual sin. They call him Lord, but they don't obey his word. They call him Lord, but they live daily with virtually no thought of him. They, they go through days or even weeks or months without even having a thought about Christ and his role in their life. They call him Lord, but he's not, not part of their life plans, not part of their uh, agenda, their goals. They, they don't do the will of the Father. Frankly, they don't know his will because they've never really sought him. They may be good people, they may be moral people, they may do a lot of religious things, but the reality is they're doing those things in their own power and they're doing those good things to try to earn God's favor. The person who's come to genuine faith in Christ has completely given up on himself, given up on her own goodness. The person who genuinely comes to faith in Christ has recognized that their self-righteousness is sinful and wicked in the eyes of God. And so they've asked God to forgive their sin. They've asked God to forgive their self-righteousness and they surrender themselves. There's that word again. They surrender themselves to full obedience to the Lordship of Christ. That's when saving faith occurs. Listen, you and I are not good people. We're just not. We need a, a miracle of God. And here's the miracle that God, in spite of our sin, in spite of our self-righteousness, in spite of our wickedness and our depravity and our rebellion, in spite of all that, the miracle is that God would still love us and make a way for us to have a relationship with him. I love the words of Paul in Romans chapter five and verse eight. Paul said, God demonstrated his love toward us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the message of the gospel. And so the question this morning, for any of us that are evaluating our salvation, the question this morning is, have I surrendered? Have I surrendered? A am I a, a new person in Christ? I'm not worried about what your lips proclaim. You can talk all day long about Christ being Lord of your life. I'm curious about what your life proclaims. Does your life reveal that Jesus is Lord and is Savior? You know, as we walk through over the next several weeks, walk through this discipleship path, each week with each stepping stone, we need to stop and evaluate and ask the Lord, Lord, where am I on, on this path and what is next? And so the question this morning very simply is, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to true saving faith, where are you? Has that occurred in your life? Is there evidence of that in your life? Is Jesus truly your Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me this morning? Would you take just a moment before I close this in prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. The Holy Spirit also calls every unbeliever, draws every unbeliever to salvation. So would you ask him this morning where you are when it comes to salvation? Have you truly been saved? Have you truly surrendered your life to Christ? And this morning, as you take a moment to evaluate that, if you find that, that you haven't done that, or if you feel there's some other issue in the relationship with Christ, we wanna help you with that. And we hope that you would contact us and let us help you with that and give you some biblical answers and counsel. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word we have so mixed up the message of salvation because we haven't looked faithfully into your word. And God, your word is very clear that when we come to faith, we, we surrender. We lay down all of our good things, all of our self-righteousness. We, we stop trying to be good enough because we can't. That when we truly come to faith, we are placing our faith in Jesus alone and the work that he did on the cross so that you would see us in his righteousness and that we'd be acceptable to you. And Father, I pray for those in our body, those who listen online who are not walking with Jesus, 
God, I pray that your spirit would bring conviction and your spirit would draw them. And God, I pray that Geyer Springs would be a, a people who faithfully walk with Christ as his disciples. And Father, over the next several weeks, as we look at this discipleship path, help us to be honest about where we are in the journey and where you would have us be. Father, thank you that you loved us enough that in spite of our sin, you sent Jesus to die for us. And God, thank you that you love us enough when we come to faith in Christ, you continually move us more and more toward maturity. Help us to be willing to go your way and to walk with you. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.